Okay, you can turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to finish the book of Ephesians today. If you're new with us, we've been rolling through for the entire year so far, actually, all four of what are commonly known as the prison letters of Paul, Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, And so we're coming to the very end, right here. And what was originally so attractive about these prison letters is we all have felt in various ways in the last year, kind of like we're on lockdown, we're in some type of house arrest, some kind of prison situation where the normal way of life has been kind of taken away from us in in various aspects. And so to kind of parallel that with someone who is living under house arrest in Rome, unjustly charged, awaiting an unjust judge, And it's going to be an unjust trial. And so how does he respond in the midst of it? When he's squeezed, what kind of fruit is coming out of his life? Because that's a parallel and a challenge and an invitation for us. When When we're getting squeezed by the circumstances of life, what kind of fruit is coming out? We all got squeezed last year. And so what we see in the Apostle Paul is a tremendous testimony of power where God wants to make each and every follower of Jesus powerful people that are able to thrive no matter the circumstances on the outside. And that's where Paul's writing things from prison about his peace and his hope and his joy and his satisfaction in the Lord. He says, I consider everything rubbish compared to the greatness, the surpassing greatness of just knowing Jesus Christ. And that's right there the key to life. To know Jesus Christ, to know him in the depths of the intimacy that we're made for, is the satisfaction of our soul. Everything else is rubbish compared to knowing Jesus Christ. That's his testimony in prison. And so from that place of genuine encounter with God, so he, to follow our theme so far this morning, as he has been made radiant by God, now he's sharing good news. He's sharing the light. He's sharing testimony. That's what Paul's letters are. Just, we always got to know that. They're just, they are testimony of his authentic walk with God. He didn't write these from a vacuum. They weren't just dictated to him by the Holy Spirit without experience. This is the stuff that he has lived through, fought through. He's been through the pit, seen God lift him up, put a radiance on him, a new song to sing, and now he's sharing testimony. And so this last part here in Ephesians 6 is really the culmination of the book. I think it's the marching orders, and it's really good news for all of us. If you hear nothing else, hear this. God's will for your life as a follower of Jesus Christ is that he's given you enough defensive tools and offensive weapons to be a victorious warrior, period. And we can all step into more of that in our life. We're never done. So it's not a been there and done that. You can upgrade your armor. Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you might be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Finally, that's what Paul opens this with. Finally, here is my final charge to you. In other words, 
which is very important. These are the marching orders as you finish this letter. What's on God's heart for you? Paul started with incredible foundations that go all the way back into eternity. If you weren't with us, we made the case over and over that this is a general letter, although it now is known as Ephesians. It it didn't even originally have a title on it. It was a general letter to anyone who would have the eyes to see and ears to hear and, and is hungry to know about Jesus. This is literally Christianity 101. It's even more general than the book of Romans because it's not even addressed to a people. This is the good news in summary, according to Paul. And he starts way back in eternity past this agape love of God, that God predestined a plan where he would adopt a people to be his beloved sons and daughters, and they would get to share with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all the inheritance of heaven, as it says in Ephesians 1, 3, that every spiritual blessing in heaven is yours in Christ. And that was God's plan from eternity past, as it says in 1, 5, He predestined us out of agape love to be adopted as sons and daughters. That was God's plan from the whole time. And then it goes on in the book to talk about that as we receive that by faith, based on the finished work that Jesus did on the cross, to break down the barrier between God and humanity and between God and one another, those ancient barriers of hostility, whatever they may be, are to come down in the name of Jesus as a foretaste of the coming kingdom where every tongue, tribe, and nation is around the throne in unity as that family of God, beloved children of God. And then he goes on to say in chapter 4 that you have a new nature in Christ. Christ. It's not just positional that you actually have the new nature, that you are recreated in the image of God in true holiness and righteousness. So you have the power to put on that new nature by choice so you can get rid of sin. Sin does not have to be your master. No sin has to win. You can put on the new nature and learn as you follow Christ to live victoriously. So this is some incredibly good news for life now and into the future. And so with all that great news about who God is and who we are in God's eyes and the promises coming our way that are available now, he then says, now, by the way, put all that into this reality. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are a soldier in the army of God. Make no mistake about it. So he says, so finally, this is where it's all leading. This is his final charge. You need to know the reality of who you are, and the battle that you're in. He goes on to say, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the devil's schemes or the schemes of the devil. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. So that's a sober reality that the spiritual war is real. And even says this present darkness... So even though in chapter 2, where he clearly says that Jesus is the cosmic Lord over the universe, that right now, in kind of the the now, the in-between stage, Christ came, he lived a perfect life, he died on the cross, he was raised for our sins, or excuse me, he was raised from the dead for our sins to make this new life possible, to reconcile us to God. So that's already begun. It's real. It's happening. We can be renewed right now. Yet, We still live in this present darkness. It's a sobering reality that Jesus called the devil the God of this world. So until that day that Jesus returns and fully consummates his kingdom, we live in this present darkness where we are battling against spiritual forces of evil. There's actually that word forces is not even in the Greek. It's kind of a helpful like description. It just says it's really spiritual evil. I kind of like that better. The battle we face every day when we wake up is against spiritual evil. A fundamental worldview of the Bible, you have to believe the most real thing in the world is the invisible spirit realm. And it's just this fundamental picture. It's it's very different, and it's easy in our Western, in many ways, very comfortable existence to not be forced to see the reality of the spirit world. Light and darkness. So Paul is making sure, finally he says, do not go marching out into life without this reality 
that there is spiritual evil and it's coming against you. Listen to his language. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. He's like, I want you to be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. That word schemes is, is an important one. It's methodes. It's where we get the word method. It's like it is the word in Greek. So I like that better than schemes because I need to sober myself with the reality that we face intelligent spiritual evil that is crafting methods for your defeat. They're not stupid. There are methods, schemes to get you to live defeated. And the devil plays dirty and he plays close. The word wrestle, think about that. Where is the attack coming from? It's a wrestling match. They're not coming from way over there. It's not the sniper you can't see. This is a, this is a picture of MMA ground and pound. This is, you are on the floor, it's dirty, your enemy is, it's, you're, you're right there. It's messy, it's sweaty, it's bloody, it's close, it's intimate. It's why the sword of the spirit is the size of a dagger, so you can, in intimate combat, destroy your enemy. The enemy's going to come for you, and he's going to come close to home. That's the point. He's going to come where you're vulnerable. So when we have those thoughts in our minds that say things, you know, like, God couldn't love me. I've messed up too much. I haven't done enough. I'm not good enough. Just give up on those, on those dreams you have, those holy dreams, those, those passions. God could never use you. Or when you, when you sense that conflict arising in those closest to you, that's one of the most easy tells of the enemy. He fights dirty, he fights close, it's going to be attacking those who are most dear to you. So when you sense that conflict, he's just doing what he's always been doing. The devil was one who's tried to divide from the beginning. He's trying to erect those ancient barriers between those who are meant to be closest. That was his plan from the beginning. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He broke the power of that. That doesn't mean it's still not the devil's scheme and his method. This whole thing is about learning to recognize how he works, his methods, and then live in the power of God so that we can overcome them. But he's going to come, and he's going to fight dirty, and he's going to fight close. He wants you divided. He wants you divided from your family, from your kids, from your spouse, from those closest to you. He wants you to hate your boss. He wants you to be bitter with your neighbors. He wants you to not like yourself. Why did Jesus say when someone said, what's the most important thing? Love God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Jesus made a, an assumption that to, in order to love others well, there's a healthy self-love. How you see, your, you see yourself, how God sees you. That's one of the clearest, easiest ways that the, that the enemy attacks. And he can even use theology to do it. He can even use like, oh, you're a sinner. You're horrible. You're messed up. You're blah, 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 blah. And that's, I mean, we've, I'm not going to repeat the whole book of Ephesians, but we, that's the stuff that Paul went after. Your identity in Christ is secure. The helmet of salvation is already on your head. You're good. You won. Because <laughs> Christ was good enough. You're wearing the blessed breastplate of righteousness. The righteousness of Christ is on you. So it doesn't matter what the devil says. That's the whole point of this thing. It's like he's going to come. He's going to try. That's where you've got to know what you're wearing. You've got to know who you are in Christ. So this passage is a call to take very seriously that there is spiritual, intelligent evil that's crafting methods to destroy you. I mean, Jesus said it like this, the enemy's come to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you may have abundant life. So while we want the abundant life, we're not going to step into it if we don't recognize soberly the reality of the enemy who's trying to take that abundant life, whose goal with crafty, intelligent methods is to steal your joy, steal your hope, steal your love, kill, destroy. I mean, that's, this is real. <laughs> this is sobering. We were born into a war. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God 
that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore. Given all the realities of spiritual warfare and intelligent spiritual evil that has methods crafting against us, it's stood out to me that Paul says, take a stand four times in this passage. Stand, take a stand, withstand, stand. That's a call to be sober and alert and prepared that if we don't, if we're not ready, then we, we, we can experience, even as a follower of Jesus, we can live life feeling very defeated, feeling like we got knocked down in the pit and we just can't find a way to get out. Paul's trying to equip us to take that stand. He's passionate about this because if you don't learn how to take a stand, you will regularly experience defeat. Why? That's not meant to be a negative thing. That's just the reality because you're in a war zone. If you go into battle as a soldier with no plan and no armor and no cover and no weapons, just picture it in whatever way you want to, what's going to happen to that soldier? And Paul is saying that is just as real, except it has more at stake. Stand, therefore, he says having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I love this part here. It's the encouragement. In the reality of this spiritual war, God has provided all you need for both defense and offense. God has provided all you need to be a victorious warrior. This is not doom and gloom. This is sober reality, sober reality and victory. Sure, the devil has many schemes and they're crafty and they're personal and they're dirty and they're wicked. But God has provided more than you need in, in every aspect of defense to perform to protect yourself, to take that stand so that, you know, when all the enemy assaults you in every way possible and he launches all the missiles, and but when the dust clears, you're just like, I'm standing. <laughs> I'm standing. I had all my armor on. And then God also provides enough, enough, even though in some ways right here it doesn't sound like a whole lot, it's plenty to go on the offensive. So let's look at these things just real quick here. He's giving you the shield of faith. So that when devil hur hurls lies at you about who you are, about who God is, who you are in God's eyes, the nature of God, what's going to happen to your future, all those methods where the enemy knows you're vulnerable. So whatever those fears are that you have, whatever those vulnerabilities and weakness, maybe those wounds, the devil is dirty. That's where he's going to He's going to poke the wounds. So just know it and don't beat yourself up. Just know that's where he's going he's gonna to look for a, a vulnerability. He's going to try to just knife it as he's wrestling with you close on the ground. I mean, it's like, whoa, that's a picture. But God's given you a shield, it says. And you can upgrade that armor. This is a, a, an important reality. Can you upgrade your armor? Heaven, yes, because can your faith grow? I mean, honestly, not in arrogance at all. My shield's way bigger than 25 years ago, where what was scary to me, I'm like, bye. Not even an issue. All throughout the New Testament, it's about God, God's about growing our faith, which means in this analogy, your shield is getting bigger. So the darts that used to come your way and hurt you don't even touch you. That's cool. He's giving you the helmet of salvation to protect you. He's giving you his truth. There, uh, the, what? Who wrote these notes? That was, man, my editor was awful on this one. Put the, I just mixed two things together. <laughs> the belt of truth. It holds the whole thing together. Truth is absolutely foundational. We talked, we, Paul's talked about this a number of times in Ephesians. There are lies so clever they sound like truth all around us. It's Ephesians 4, I think, I think 12, somewhere around there. That's one of the enemy's schemes. Lies so clever they sound like truth. 
And he says that if, if, if we don't have that truth in that same passage in Ephesians 4, then we get tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, every new sound. It doesn't have to be in the church. Doctrine is just whatever people say is true and real. So there's, every time you hear a message, every advertisement is doctrine. So every idea, every message, we can get tossed to and fro by them. Our minds just can go crazy like schizophrenic unless we're anchored in the truth. The belt of truth is meant to hold it all together. So we're not running around naked and vulnerable. That's the picture. The truth will protect us from the lies so clever they sound like truth. The breastplate of righteousness. This is beautiful where our identity is secure. What are we wearing? We're wearing the righteousness of Christ. The breastplate of righteousness. I, we stand before God as followers of Jesus. And what does the Bible say? We are spotless, blameless righteous in God's eyes. Colossians 1 says that right now in Christ. We believe in Christ. We've put on his righteousness. I mean, we got to get that. That's what God sees. He looks at you and he sees righteous perfection if you're wearing Christ. That's a good defense. And you put on the helmet of salvation. Wearing a helmet is meant to give you confidence, right? Even when you see that little kids put on your bikes, like, hey, and then sometimes they get a little too, too confident. Oh, cool, I have a helmet. Now I can try a flip off the curb. It's like, no, 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 no. It's, just, it's like if you fall over. Helmets give you confidence, and that's exactly what it's supposed to do right here. You're not feeling so vulnerable, and I love that it's the helmet of salvation. The idea is run into battle confident because salvation is done. You've already won. You've already won. You have salvation. You're wearing it on your head. Makes you a little more confident going into the battle. Some beautiful defense. And then he moves into a little offense. Before we get there, we just got to see. The Lord is giving us all of this. This is the, the but God. God's will for us as followers of Jesus is that his strength would be in us and upon us. You know how that started that pa the passage started, right? Finally, be strong in the strength of the Lord. You're going to need to be strong to get through this life. It's in some ways it's just like sorry, it's just the reality. We all wish it was a little easier and more comfortable, but it's not. We live in a broken and fallen world where spiritual evil's real. So to get through this life just to survive you're going to need to be strong. And then to be victorious, you're going to need to be wildly strong. And Paul's whole thing is, that's what this is about. Be strong. You can be strong. You can be strong in the strength of his might. So here's how you put it on. You will be strong in your defense. God's will is that he has given you enough in these defensive measures that you will be strong enough to withstand any attack of the enemy so that when the dust clears, as we looked at, Paul said four times, you're still standing. Yeah. I want to live like that, right? I mean, this is, this is awesome testimony. And this guy's been through the ringer. He's been through the worst of it all. Betrayal and persecution and you name it. He's gone through it. He's lost, probably he's lost his whole family for following Christ, been rejected by his own people numerous times, been kicked out of the, the, out of the synagogue his identity, he's been told that he, is, that he is cursed of God by his own people, by his own people many times to the point, and then they gave him 39 lashes. I mean, the, and, and he says, I'm still standing. Not only that, I've got some weapons that the Lord gave me. So he goes on. He says, he's got the gospel of peace on your feet, meaning that God has equipped us with the life-transforming, world-transforming, salvation good news of who Jesus is, and it's on your feet, not a coincidence, because you're meant to take that good news and march into the enemy's territory, because anywhere that your feet march into darkness, if you're carrying light, darkness flees. So it's a picture of advancing into enemy territory. You have the good news on your feet for a reason, 
not just to dance in here, but to walk out there and to go and to see that there is territory that is under the oppression of the enemy and to believe this is the rise and shine for the glory of the Lord is upon you where you walk into darkness. If you are carrying the light of Christ, it will flee. So I kind of I honestly saw this like for the first time in my life in this way of, you know, you kind of think like, well, there's a whole not a lot of offense here. And God's like, I don't need much. <laughs> Just walk. Just walk. If I'm on you, it's enough. If the good news is upon you, in you, through you, I'm enough. I was like, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> And then the last one that just is a great emphasis as we walk and march, we have a sword empowered by the spirit, a sword that is the spirit. I love that, that the sword of the spirit, the truth of the word of God is the spirit, the truth of who God is. It's not this standalone it's, it's not about philosophy or just a mental ascent or these just ideas on a paper that, that the truth, biblical truth, is something that it's a person. And so it's encountered in relationship through the spirit. It's the sword of the spirit. Like they're one. Real truth is, is encountered. It's not just thought about. So it's the the truth of who God is with the the power of the Spirit making it real so that it is encounter. Like we talked about from Friday night as we prayed for people, as we're praying truth and the Holy Spirit is there, it becomes a sword of the Spirit. So problems are cut off and they end up, after prayer, literally glowing. And Paul's saying, and you got that sword. As Hebrews says, it's, it's sharper. The truth of God is sharper. It, sharper than any two-edged sword. It's living and it's active, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It's living and active. And is that not what people are looking for? They're looking for life. Who can I go to for life? Where is the abundant life? Where is the good life? That's every message, every doctrine out there is here's the good life. Here's what you need for the good life, to be successful, to be happy, whatever. Here's the good life. We carry the word of God, which is the sword of the spirit, which is living and active. It carries the one who is the abundant life. And to know him is better than anything else in life. So it's incredible here. It's beautiful. We're we're almost done. But just to see what is God's heart for you in this lost, hurting, broken, and crazy world full of attacks. Well, through the defense and offense that God makes available, God's will for every single follower of Jesus is to become this victorious warrior. I love these kind of passages. This says, as a Christian, do not accept defeat. It's not God's will. Otherwise, what do you do with this passage? Your, your God's will is not for you to live the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years of your life until you go to heaven just getting your butt kicked by the enemy and, and oh, but I'm holding on to, in heaven, things are going to be right. Stop it. It's not biblical. You are meant to be a victorious warrior, and you might not be there yet, feeling all the victory, but nothing in God's word says, you're right. Enemy kicks your butt, accept defeat, stay there, whine about it till eternity. No way. We don't have to do that. When we get in the pit, we're like, oh man, I got knocked down. But you know what? God's will is not that I stay here. Not that I stay here. What's his will? Lift me out of the pit. This is Psalm 40. Put a new song in my mouth. Put a new song in my mouth. That's victory. A spontaneous song coming out of you is, God, you're so good. Here's my next testimony. Here's my next testimony. Here's my next testimony. And what is going to happen in your testimonies is, and maybe even unknowingly, you're going to be talking about the defense, the defensive armor that God's growing in you. And you're going to be talking about the offensive weapons that you're learning to use. That every testimony, you'll have it. 
He wants us to be victorious warriors. So the last closing point that Paul makes, I promise, is awesome. I've never seen it. I never saw it in my life. How do you keep your armor on? That's a good question. I remember, I remember hearing about that, asking about that. And there's this question, oh, you got to put on your armor every day. And some people are talking about like, they, oh, I just never take my armor off. And I was like, I don't really know the answer to that. Oh, it's cool. I actually read the Bible and there's the answer. Here it is. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end. Keep alert with all perseverance. How do you keep your armor on? Pray. Whoa. Hello. Went to grad school for that one. Prayer is the power source, Paul's saying. Here's all these truths, all these awesome things about who God is and how he wants you to live. And it's, it's real simple. He's like, just, so just stay connected to me. Pray at all times in the spirit. That doesn't need to be a scary thing. It's a, there's a parallel there with 1 Thessalonians where Paul says, uh, pray without ceasing. My confession, I've said but many times, that was a terrifying verse. I really, I kind of hated it. Honestly, I don't mean to be rude. I mean, just real. Like, because it, it felt like such a task. It's like, I can't do that. So I, my, my picture was like, kinda, you know, that means I'm, I'm like on my knees in a closet with the door closed with a list of people. I, 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 my heart's not that big, Lord. <laughs> All th- without ceasing? Nah. Live connected to me. It's about, as Brother Lawrence said, and he's a hero that kind of unlocked it for me, there's no place and no time where you can't have that quiet, even silent, secret conversation going on with God. There's nowhere. That is literally like the one thing in the world that cannot be taken from you at any point. Is that connection to God. He's there. And so this is kind of all comes together. You keep your armor on by just staying connected. Keep that conversation going. Keep that gratitude going. Keep that praise going. Whatever it is that keeps that, 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 that simple, not striving, but simple focus on God throughout the day. Where you're recognizing his, recognizing his grace, you're grateful for him, you're open to opportunities, you're feeling dependent on his power, you're praising him for the good things that are going on. There's lots of different ways, but you're just praying. It's just a prayer is just a conversation. Simplify it. Just talk to God. Keep, keep the line of communication open throughout the day. Find ways to do it. And this is what's amazing. So it says prayer is what keeps your armor on. The two things, it keeps you alert and keeps you persevering. That makes total sense. Of course, of course it's prayer. Prayer is what keeps you alert to these realities of this spiritual warfare and of who you are in God's eyes and what God has available to you, right? Your defense and your offense. Prayer is what keeps you connected to that. When we're not praying, that's when we forget that stuff. That's when we're not alert and aware to the realities of the spiritual warfare around us or who we are in God's eyes. So yeah, prayer makes sense. Stay alert. And prayer keeps you persevering. That's this closing word. Prayer keeps you from quitting. Prayer keeps you from quitting. That's, that's what happens when you don't persevere. And that's a wow. That's, that's, that's a meme right there. Prayer will keep you from quitting because his, that's the sober reality. If you're not connected to God, you're going to want to quit. At what? Everything. Life. It gets hard. Prayer is that plug in, that syncing up with God, that connection to where you ain't going to quit. You're going to stay with him, and actually you're going to become a victorious warrior. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that not only have you secured our eternity, you have adopted us as beloved children of God where every spiritual blessing in heaven is awaiting us. There is also a now that you're wanting to pour out. You are wanting to teach us to live so connected to you that victory is our norm. And victory is our expectation because of the strength that is in us, in your strength. 
So I pray a blessing on all of us right now. Holy Spirit, would you upgrade our armor? Upgrade that shield of faith. Upgrade our confidence in your character. Upgrade our promises that we're holding on to. Upgrade the security of our identity in you through our righteousness in Christ. Upgrade the hope of salvation so that we know in the grand scheme of things we've already won. Upgrade our ears to hear your truth that holds it all together. Upgrade our boldness to take the good news that is on our feet out into darkness so that we can watch you do wonders. And upgrade our our confidence in the sword of the spirit that is alive. And it is what people are looking for. Let's just take a quiet moment, church, and just between you and God, have a, have a conversation here, a prayer. We'll close it in prayer like it says to do. I encourage you in your own words, in your own way, express to God from this passage in Ephesians, what is standing out to you? What are you hungry for? What do you need God to do? Where, where is the strength of the Lord needed so that you can walk more in the victory that is yours in Christ. Let's just take a moment, just between you and God, have an authentic conversation, a prayer. Go for it.